Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Spiritual Spotlight series. Today, I am joined by Reverend Barbara Lane. Reverend Barbara Lane, thank you so much for coming on the Spiritual Spotlight series. I'm so happy you're here. I'm so happy to be here too, Rachel. Thank you so much for having me. I've What's been it? looking forward to it. Oh, that's so awesome. So yeah. let me ask you this. So your rich tapestry of experiences from being a foster child to an author and a counselor is really inspiring. How do these varied roles inform and enhance each other in your life and work? Mm, one just builds on the other, actually. I think um, sometimes we're called to do a particular thing with our life, and it has to do with our history. And in the process of healing uh, trauma, in my case, um, people entered my life that I think I was open to receive <laughs> that led me to see parts of of myself that I hadn't seen prior to that. And one of them was uh, indeed an empathy, I think, that I carry for individuals who are suffering. So they just kind of all intermingled, you know, my childhood, uh, dealing with loss and separation really gave me some compassion, I think. And then um, there was a really strong spiritual element to my healing. And that led me to uh, pursue ministerial counseling. So does that answer? <laughs> it's a good answer. <laughs> so, I mean, so you do have a book. So Broken Water, mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. memoir serves mm -hmm. a beacon hope for many. Yeah. Um, what motivated you to pen down such a personal and poignant journey of resilience and faith? Mm. So I have to backtrack till yeah, I was three. <laughs> yeah. I was born the ninth of 11 sisters and uh, when I was three, our family fell apart and um, our, uh, the younger ones of us fell into uh, an orphanage. We were placed in an orphanage. And I tell people, you would think that would be so traumatic for me, but it wasn't because I was placed there with my sisters and I was gifted and graced with sisters who loved me so much that it gave me what I needed, I think, to get through the rest of the story, which was we were separated, foster care, adoptions, and whatever, and reunited 43 years later. Yes. Wow, that's amazing. So, yes, it's just an amazing story. It was really uh, uh, a miracle that it all happened. And once we were together a while, I loved my sisters so much. They asked me to write this story. I can't tell them no in any way, <laughs> shape or form. <laughs> so I spent 15 years gathering their stories because Rachel, not one of us escaped sexual abuse in our childhoods. 11 and, sisters and not uh, one of you. Is uh, uh, right. And so it took 15 years because each sister was at a different stage of their healing. Uh, we had a path. If someone didn't want to share their story, the book was dead. And I'm so proud to say all 11 of us came forward and shared our stories and we all bounced. So I think that's the resilience and the hope that we wanted to share with other women and actually men as well who have gone through these same kinds of issues and, and show them there's another side to this. You can, you know, you don't have to carry this your entire life. So that's the story. <laughs> I, I, Long I, in the making. Yeah, 15 years. And mm -hmm. I I mean, with mm -hmm. 11 sisters, and mm -hmm. like you said, you were abandoned and abused, reunited after 43 years. Mm -hmm. And let me ask you this, with all of your sisters, are you all very close? We are so close. We have um, six of us left now, five have, have passed on, but we're still close because they haunt me. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> for example, I had one of my older sisters, her name was Annie, and she knew more about our background than any of us. And so I really wanted to learn her story So, because I didn't know my background. I didn't yeah. know what happened. I was too young. And she kept saying she wouldn't tell her story until her husband passed. So eventually her husband did pass. And then she was just kind of like a a jolly gal and she just said you're gonna get your ass down here and get my story because it'll be the best one in the book la 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 and she did <laughs> i know right sister she did know the most of our history yeah. and and um as as i feel like the entire book was um divinely guided 
because if I'd have gone and 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 researched and met with sisters, I would have done them chronologically mm. because it would make sense. But you know, my intuition, my guide said, no, see this one first, this one second. And the first sister I visited to gather her story was the first to die. Little did I know I wouldn't have caught her story. And Annie, the one who said, get your, you know what, down here. Uh, she lived in Kansas at the time and I'm on the East Coast. Um, died 10 days after I got her story. So it, you, I could not have planned the journey of this book no way. I, I just had to listen to to the divine guidance I was getting. And I'm so grateful that I did because I would have missed this such spectacular time with my sisters. Yeah. So, so let me ask you this. Like you just brought uh -huh. up like trusting your divine guidance, mm -hmm. trusting your intuition. Was mm -hmm. that something that you always had in place from a young child? Or is it something mm -hmm. that you kind of tapped into as you got older? I think I always had it, but didn't recognize it. And I think that um, some abused children tap into it more quickly because they like to read the environment so they know what's coming at them, <laughs> right? You know what's coming, so you know how to take care of yourself, hopefully. But I had a, I had an experience once. Um, I had a uh, emergency, I had my colon ruptured. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so I was in the ER and, you know, it wasn't looking too good. And uh, at the time, I asked my husband to bring me um, some CDs back then. You still played the discs and with the earphones and that. I was listening to Deepak Chopra. And in that process, um, I had an experience. And the only thing I could call it is it's, it's, a, it's a going into a zero where nothing exists except creativity and I, I, you could call that God, you could call it a glimpse of heaven, whatever words, I don't have any words for it. There is no way to describe what I experienced. And it was very brief, very brief. But after that experience, I knew my, my colon healed and that there wasn't any need for treatments. But I also knew something more important. It didn't matter. It didn't matter because none of this matters you know there's just so much more it's like a dream we yeah. could wake up from it you know um so after that experience my intuition went through the roof I would walk wow. by a pregnant person a pregnant woman I knew if they were having a boy or a girl and you know I, I just it was coming at me everywhere and in every direction you know the psychic kind of knowingness hey. that that came with that so, so did you have that medical emergency before you started writing the book or during while you're writing the during, book? During, during, wow. yeah, during the, yeah. So yeah. it's in the book, actually, that experience, although I have to claim any way I try to describe it is inadequate. It, it, it's beyond words, it's yeah. beyond uh, comprehension, what I experienced. So. I mean, what a beautiful one mm -hmm. healing experience and two, right. like just like having an experience where you don't have words for it. Like that just there, sounds I so it's profound. I, I would, I could try, but it's impossible. <laughs> I love that. So mm -hmm. let me ask you this, drawing from mm -hmm. your background in human development, family psychology and personal experiences, how do you perceive mm -hmm. the complex interplay of family attachment and resilience in the face of adversity? So attachment is, in my opinion, primary uh, to our existence. Obviously, as an infant, you have to attach to a caretaker or a bottle or something to, just to survive, right? So that attachment um, can, can go beautifully. You can attach and, and then have the caretaker correspond with a bonding to you. Mm. This is what I think occurred between me as, as an infant and my older sisters, I attached to them and they bonded to me. So that was all beautiful. And that's the roots of resilience. Mm. Now, <laughs> so many infants never have this experience of attachment and bonding. However, I think there's also attachment and bonding with the spirit. And this can happen at any stage of your life. 
So, you know, you're always attached to spirit, God, the divine, the feminine, whatever word you use for that, but we forget. And when we don't have that actual interaction with a caretaker or a teacher or a friend or a loved one, it's still there, but with God, it's still there, but we forget. Mm. And so the healing process can be a, a, a form of waking up, a form of remembering who we really are. So all of those things you mentioned tie together in the attachment and bonding with God or whatever word you use for that, <laughs> for which there is no word. <laughs> I love that. So throughout your journey, faith seems to be a central pillar. How yeah. has faith in something greater, greater than oneself aided in healing from trauma and building a fulfilling life? Mm. Because I think that's where hope, hope is found. And when you have uh, a sense that there's something greater than you, like we think of the book of Genesis in my Christian background, um, most religions are uh, <laughs> egocentric. It's built around the human being, the person, right? That this is what comes primary, right? It's very egocentrical. But if you look at the book of Genesis, it begins with what? Creation. Right. She's like, I'm like, Mother. I'm on the spot. <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, like, my brain. I'm like, um, 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 thank you. <laughs> you know, think about that. You know, you creation, you know, the sun, the moon, the earth, the waters, every, and it's all good. Yeah. So, you know, when we connect back to that essence of creation, it's in everything, right? It's in you, it's in me, it's in the trees, it's in, you know, this computer, even though I get so frustrated with it, <laughs> it's sometimes technology, but, but you know, it, it's finding it and everything allows you the opportunity to find yourself because it reflects back to you exactly who you are, which is divine. I, that's just so profound. Like, I just love the way that, I mean, it's, they're very complex, deep meaning things that you're saying, but you, the way that you are presenting it, it just makes it like, oh, you're right. Oh, that good. makes sense. That <laughs> it makes is sense. rather simple, isn't it? <laughs> it is. So yeah. let me ask you this. You have an upcoming book, What Your Inner Child Knows, Promises mm -hmm. to Be a Guide for Many. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe share some, shed some lights on the central theme of the book and how it complements the narrative of Broken Water? So it's it's similar to Broken Water, but separate. I'm also writing a um, companion book to Broken Water, but this is actually a self-help book to help anyone who has uh, is struggling with trauma or child abuse or um, just life in general, understand how 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 wise their inner child is. Of course, the inner child is that spark of divinity, right? That's inside. And what kind of wisdom can that have? And it goes through nine steps ranging from the first, which is the most difficult thing to do is accepting the reality of your childhood or your trauma or your experience, accepting the reality. So, so many people, in my opinion, get stuck in therapy because they repeat, this is what mm -hmm. happened to me, this is what happened to me, and the story goes on and on, and the thoughts in the brain just keep regurgitating over and over, and you can't move forward. My approach says, just say, it was less than perfect, and leave it at that. So, accept that your reality was less than perfect, and leave it at that. And then we go on to talk about how to honor that inner child because most inner children, young kids do the best they can in any given situation. So they may develop uh, dysfunctional behaviors where as an adult, it just doesn't work. But if you honor that child that you once were, yeah, that did the best they could and maybe telling lies saved them once upon a time, maybe being quiet saved them once upon a time. So, you know, all the things that they would develop, stealing maybe kept them from being hungry. All these things, if we can look at it differently, this is all about shifting our perception, which is a miracle, by the way, you know, shifting our perception about how we blame or judge our inner child. And some clients would tell me, oh, I don't blame my inner child. Then they think about it and go, oh, I just despise my inner child, right? So, wow. you know, that's where self-hatred begins. So we try to switch that in, into learning how to honor 
the child that you once were. And we go into understanding emotions and we go into, um, you know, what emotions or what behaviors do you want to change? And then we get real rational and we say, okay, let's put a put an agenda together. Let's put a plan. How do you plan on changing these emotions and what can they do for you? Then we talk about something called the in-between place. When you learn about your emotions, you may realize you have extremes like anger. I never get angry or I'm raging all the time. Neither of those are healthy, right? Neither of those allow you to express the divine child within, right? Mm -hmm. So what's the in-between place? You know, healthy anger, how to express it appropriately. So we go into all those kinds of things and then how to live from that in-between place so that your life changes. And there's other things in there too. But but I think it, I've used it with many, 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 many of my clients. I'm kind of resurrecting it and uh, improving it at this point. And I'm considering maybe just putting it online as a course. So it may, it may, um, may become that. It, it that sounds very it. powerful. Like I think mm -hmm. as a, a, a course would be very uh -huh. impactful for so many people. Uh huh. I, I think it that. would. So, you know, that's what I'm doing. Just like, wait and see, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It won't be long. This month, I'm assuming I'll have everything. I love it. Figured I love out. It. So mm -hmm. let me ask you this. With over 25 years in pri private practice, mm -hmm. you must have encountered numerous stories of resilience and transformation. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe share one that profoundly impacted you or mirrored mm -hmm. your own journey in some way? Mm -hmm. I had a gentleman walk into my office once who was so beaten that's the only way physically psychologically as a child and carried that with him that he he could not look me in the eyes he you know just glanced down at the floor um he was raised by a white supremacist and was beaten and, and just all these terrible terrible things occurred to him and he still touches my heart to this day but what we did, the way I worked with my clients and the way I worked with Kelvin, and he doesn't mind me sharing his story, I could tell you. And he's written a book, which I'll share with you in a minute, um, was to look beyond that and, and to see his inner child, to see the divinity in him. And he could tell me all the things that occurred. And I was willing to listen, but I didn't lose sight not for one second with him of who he really was, kept reminding him of that. We went through the nine step process and many others. Um, and um, now he, he gives uh, lectures about his childhood and has written a book called The Sins of My Father by Kelvin Pierce. I'll give him a plug there because he's amazing. He, he started an orphanage in Georgia, in Europe, he has three of them now, and he called it Divine Child after our work. So it's a beautiful story, touches my heart, and it, it testimony to the fact that no matter how dark your past might have been, it's just a forgetting who you are. So <laughs> oh, I love the ripple effect of your work. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's that. beautiful, right? I, I just, yeah. It, and I think we all are like a ripple in a pond. We may not see where they all go and you are as well doing what you're doing right now obviously this is a beautiful podcast <laughs> so nice <laughs> yeah, well it's true That's i mean so we're sweet. all trying right we're all we're all sending the message it's a beautiful thing so let me ask you this your relationship with jem your childhood sweetheart seems to yes. be a heartwarming chapter in your life how mm -hmm. has this bond influenced your perspective on love relationship and healing mm. That, you know, there is such a thing perhaps as a soulmate. <laughs> and I met mine when we were 14. <laughs> I know. And and he knew my history because we started out as friends and confidants. And he had this remarkable ability to listen and to allow me my own process of healing. Like you have to do this or you have to do that. He never said it was this support that, you know, then I would, I took the next step or took the next step or took the next step. 
And he was just so handsome at 14. I couldn't help but fall in love with him. What can I say? (laughs) So beautiful. I love that. (laughs) Oh, I love that. Let me ask you this before we ask the last question, Mm -hmm. if anyone is interested in learning more about you, purchasing your book, um, pre-ordering your books and course to come, Uh where's the best place to go to? The book can be found anywhere on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. You can also go to my website if you want an autographed copy. It's barbaralang.info, barbaralang.info. And there you can find out about the upcoming course. Uh, If you'd rather have the workbook in your hands, you can pre-order it there. And everything else about our story, pictures of of, uh, my sisters and what have you are on there. So I have a blog now that I'm, I'm promoting. Um, so I think, yeah, I've been pretty busy. <laughs> She's a busy lady. Busy yes, lady. yes. Why I'm... not? <laughs> Why not? I think you retire, you die. <laughs> My dad would say the same thing. He's in his seventies and he refuses to retire. So I think, uh, yeah, it's, Can I it's keep a moving? good thing. Can well, and I, you may not die physically, but you know, you, mentally, I, I like, mentally, you like to stay relevant. We yeah. just want to stay relevant. I have I have a lot still to give. One hundred percent. I keep giving it till you know. I love that. So let me ask yeah. you this: for those that are grappling with their own haunting histories, mm-hmm. what words of wisdom or or encouragement would you like to share based on your own transformative journey? Mm. Reach out for help. Don't hesitate. You know, there's there's such shame involved with some of our traumas that it keeps us. Uh, It limits our ability to reach out, but reach out for help. And if you find a therapist that you don't care for, you don't feel like you're working with, it's okay. Try another one, Uh, a clergy member. uh, I often respond to emails. If someone's in in a dire situation, it may take me a while, but I respond to every email I get. Uh, BarbaraLane.author at gmail.com. At least I can give you some direction on maybe where to go or what to do, um, but but don't hesitate to reach out. And that that is the hardest step because you know what you're opening yourself up to. But I, and and you you know to repeat to yourself every day, look in the mirror and say, "You're a divine child. You're a divine. You're full of good, wonderful energy. You just forgot. All you have to do is remember." I love that. Barbara, thank you so much for coming on the Spiritual Spotlight series. It's my pleasure. I certainly enjoyed speaking with you, Rachel. (laughs) 